And that song, In Christ Alone, gets me every time. Some of you know, might, might know that's my, one of my favorites. But it's also kind of like a theme song for the book of Ephesians. There's so much of that that we're going to be talking about uh, being in Christ. So anyway, we're going to get right to it. So can you just turn me down just a touch? I think I'm a little too loud. Thanks. Um, get right to it. So first thing is, that I want to talk about is the Bible. The Bible is a precious book, is it not? Yes. It's the most valuable book to ever be produced. I mean, it's precious, most of all, because it's the very words of God himself. Men and women have died for this book. People have gone through extraordinary lengths to get this book into people's hands all over the world. But it's not just the Bible in general that I'm talking about being valuable and precious. It's also specific copies of the Bible that can be very valuable and very precious to us. Back in my office, I have a copy, uh, I have a Bible that was my granddad's ordination Bible. When he was ordained as a pastor, the Baptist Association of Australia, where he was, uh, gave him this Bible as part of the ordination process. And it's what he preached from for, for many, many years. At home, I have one of my father's Bibles after he passed away. It's got all his markings in it and, and notations in the margins. It's, they're treasures. But as special as those are, as treasured as those are, even more special is a Bible that you personally have used. In my mind, what makes a Bible all the more beautiful is when it's got the dog-eared pages and the well-worn cover because it shows that you have been in it and been using it and getting it deep into you. Now right here in my hand, I have one of those Bibles of my own that is precious. It's not one I use commonly anymore, but this is a, it's a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, New International Version. And uh, this is given to me, it says to our son Craig from Love from Dad and Mom, Christmas 1983. This was the, the Bible that I used through high school um, until I, it was all the way until my 20th birthday when I got another Bible, which I still use today, regularly. So what does that have to do with what we're talking about today? Well, today we're starting through, uh, on a series through the book of Ephesians. And I have longed to preach through this book because this is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It was in Ephesians that I was first shown how a person can dig into the Word of God, can study it deeply down to the word level, the grammar level, thoroughly understanding what the author was trying to say. And this Bible was the one that I used for that study. It has the marks, it has the circles around the different words, it has the notes in the margins from that very first study in the book of Ephesians. It was, this was in high school, it was... Um, our church youth group was kind of one of more, those more focused on games and skits for the most part. But there was one, uh, one of the leaders of our youth group, his name was Tom Martin, and he took a few, aside a few of us guys who he could see had a little more interest in the Bible. And I still remember, I'm friends with several of the other guys that were in that study, Steve and Brian and Scott and the other Scott, and, and, and those are the ones that I remember off the top of my head. But Tom led us through this more serious study in the book of Ephesians. And that was the beginning for me of understanding how you could dig deeper into the word of God and understand more clearly and more precisely what the passage is saying. So I guess in terms of studying biblical truth, Ephesians is kind of like my first love. And so that is why it is with great eagerness that I start this series today through the book of Ephesians. But other than my personal special interest in the book of Ephesians, why are we going to study Ephesians? Well, I'll, I'll say first of all that uh, I'm in good company in loving the book of Ephesians. Uh, apparently, it was John Calvin's favorite of all the epistles. A poet and philosopher of the 1800s named Samuel Taylor Coleridge, some of you may have heard that name before, called Ephesians one of the divinest compositions of man. Many scholars consider Ephesians to be the crown of Paul's writings, even higher than Romans. It is the purest 
and most distilled essence of Paul's theology. A more modern scholar said it this way. He said, the few pages of Ephesians cover an extraordinary range of theological topics with clarity and precision. The contents are simple enough and so foundational that the letter should be read and studied by every new believer. And yet the theological concepts are so profound that the most mature Christians never seem to master its depths. I will even add that it's so foundational that there are many scholars who have thought that this was actually written as a catechism for new believers. And yet there are also these deep theological topics that challenge anyone. So Ephesians is both deeply theological and yet also immensely practical. Paul shows us in this book that theology isn't just dry, uh, esoteric, obscure details that only people in the ivory towers discuss. You will find, as, we, as he mentions certain theological topics, that he can't help himself but just break out into an anthem of praise for this wonderful truth that God has shown in his word. So as we study, as we embark on this study through the book of Ephesians, we, I think we will find it rich and fruitful for all of us, whatever level we are, wherever we are in our Christian walk. As another writer put it, he said, Ephesians summarizes what it means to be a Christian better than any other book of the Bible. It clarifies the heart of the Christian faith. It explores the dynamics of a personal relationship with Christ. It sets forth God's overall plan for the church, and it draws out the implications of what it means to live as a Christian. So friends, let's dig in to this wonderful book. Let us eat our fill from this spiritual feast. Amen? Amen. So let me just pray, because I want to pray right now, just as we start into this study in Ephesians, just ask God's blessing uh, on this endeavor. Will you join me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for revealing yourself in the Word, in your Word. We thank you for moving Paul to write these words in the, to the church in Ephesus that is now passed down by your superintending hand of the Holy Spirit, passed down through the generations to us that we now get to study it. Lord, as we embark on this study of Ephesians, I ask that you would give me clarity of thought and understanding as I study it throughout the week, clarity of explanation as I explain it on Sunday. Pray that you would prepare each person's heart to receive the truth of this book, and that it would transform our hearts, that it would accomplish the purpose for which you set it forth, that you might receive glory and honor, that your church might be built up. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so just so you know, this isn't going to be exactly a typical sermon. You might have already kind of sensed that. It's going to be some parts history lesson, some parts cultural uh, kind of explanation, some overview, because I want to give you some background and context to the book of Ephesians. So as we study the book, it will make more sense. You know, an illustration is, you know, a diamond is beautiful all by itself, isn't it? But it's all the more beautiful if you put it in that setting in a piece of jewelry with the filigree around it and all the other whatever fancy stuff of gold around it. So just in the same way, Ephesians is a fantastically wonderful, beautiful book all by itself. If you just parachute in and read it, it's amazing. But it's all the more beautiful if you understand the context and the background and the setting from which it comes. So today, we're actually going to be in the book of Acts almost as much as we are in the book of Ephesians. And we're going to talk about some of the details that surround this book. So with that, we will start in Ephesians, though. So go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians if you haven't gone there already or turn on your electronic device and scroll to the book of Ephesians, whatever, whichever way you do it. <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and start at the very beginning. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm just going to cover two verses today, just two, but we've got a lot of other things to talk about. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This is the word of the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace 
from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we see here is as customary with letters of that time, well, our letters too of this time, we start off knowing who wrote it and who they wrote it to. And it's kind of like your emails, right? You At the top of your email, you have the from line and the to line. That's basically what this is doing. The text here gives us clear and unambiguous statement that Paul is the author of this book. Now, however, be, despite that, uh, recently, since about the 1800s, some liberal scholars have doubted whether Paul really was the one to write this letter. But in the early church, it was virtually undisputed that Paul was the author, the true author. Because back in the early church, as they were trying to figure out which of these writings of the apostles were truly divine, which ones had that divine authority, they rejected any writings that were written falsely under some false name. But we see here at the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, so that would have been you know, 90s to 150s AD, somewhere in that time, we have records from two church fathers. One's name is Polycarp, and he was actually a disciple of the Apostle John. The other one's name is Clement of Rome, who lived, he, he overlapped with Paul and Peter. He probably would have known them, uh, or at least known directly of them. They both, in their writings, quote from the book of Ephesians as Holy Scripture. They wouldn't do that if it was written from a false author. Later in the second century, later 100s AD, other church father, fathers like Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, they quote from Ephesians and explicitly name Paul as the author. So we have no reason to doubt that Paul really is the one who wrote this letter. Now, so he wrote it uh, from prison. He wrote it during his first Roman imprisonment, which would have been about 60 to 62 AD. Somewhere in that span was when he was probably in prison there. This was the same time period that Paul wrote uh, Philippians and Colossians and Philemon. So we call those the prison epistles because they're thought to have all been written at the same time from prison. Now, notice some things that Paul says about himself right here in the greeting. First of all, he says, he, an apostle of Christ Jesus. The word apostle is used several different ways in the New Testament. In, in its broadest sense, it would mean something like just a delegate or an emissary. We might say a missionary, um, sent, someone sent for a specific purpose. I mean, churches even sent apostles. In Philippians 2.25, Epaphroditus is called an apostle of the church of Philippi. They sent him to Paul to bring a contribution to him. In 2 Corinthians 5.23, the people who, uh, who were from some of the churches in Greece who were going to go with Paul to take a monetary contribution to the church in Jerusalem were called apostles of those churches. So there are, there are little a apostles, if you will, that we see in the New Testament. And of course, in a more narrow and specific sense, we have the 12, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles. These are men who were chosen by Christ himself to accompany him during his ministry and to be witnesses after his resurrection and his ascension. These ones, we would say, have the office of apostleship. They're big A apostles, if you will. And Paul here in this letter is claiming that sort of authority, the authority of an official delegate of Jesus Christ himself, where his words carry the authority of Christ. That's what he's saying here. He's not just any old apostle. He's not just an apostle of a church. He's not a little A apostle. He is a capital A apostle, a delegate of Jesus Christ himself. He was commissioned and sent by Jesus himself for spreading the gospel among the Gentiles. So he was, we, we know this, he was not made an apostle by the twelve or by any other person. Um, he was made, as he says right here in the text, by God's will, he was made an apostle. Paul makes this very clear in another letter, in his letter to the Galatians, where his authority was in question. He says, Galatians 1, 11 and 12, he says, For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by a revelation of Jesus Christ, directly from Christ himself. Later in verses 15 and 16 of that chapter, Paul says that when God called him on the road to Damascus, 
He didn't consult with anyone. He says he didn't go up to Jerusalem to be validated by those who were already apostles. He says he was taught and commissioned directly by Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying here in this letter to the Ephesians, he's reminding them of his authority. He's reminding them that he is a delegate, a specific commissioned official, if you will, of Jesus Christ himself. So the authority with which he speaks is with God's words, with the words of Christ. So we need to be reminded of that as well. We need to receive these words, as Paul is giving them, as the words of God himself. Just like he's telling the Ephesians, he's telling us, these are God's words. So that's how we need to receive them. Now the second part of the first verse of Ephesians here says that the letter is to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. Now you need to know when Paul is saying this, he's not distinguishing between faithful saints and unfaithful saints. And oh, by the way, I'm only writing to the faithful ones. That's not what he's saying here. Probably a better way to render this phrase in English would be to say, to the saints in Ephesus, that is, or in other words, the believers in Christ Jesus. He's saying the saints are the believers in Christ Jesus. See, a saint is not a special class of person like the Catholics like to tell us. It's a word that Paul commonly uses to just describe regular believers. It just means, uh, literally means, set apart for God. You are his. You belong to him. So if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a saint. That's what Paul is talking about to these uh, Ephesians. He would say that to us. You are a saint, and this letter is to you. So this letter is written to the church, to the, the community of Christ, if you will, in Ephesus, probably in and around Ephesus in the surrounding area. Now, you need to know a little bit about Ephesus. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ephesus. Ephesus was like, I don't know, the Los Angeles of the region. It was one of the leading cities of the Roman Empire. The only, as far as we can tell from, from the kinds of research we can do, the only cities in the entire Roman Empire that were bigger than Ephesus was Rome itself and Alexandria. So probably the third largest city in the entire Roman Empire. It was the major port on the west coast of Asia. We can put a map up I have here. You can kind of see it there. It was the major port on the west coast of, they called it the province of Asia at that time. We call it Turkey now. <coughs> and then all the roads through Asia led through Ephesus to where then things, goods or whatever, would get on a ship there in Ephesus uh, and be, go somewhere else in the, in the empire. And interestingly, um, there's no port there now over the years. It's filled up with silt, and the city of the ruins of the city of Ephesus are actually several miles inland. Um, but there used to be a port there. Um, and it was also the seat of the Roman government for that whole province. This is where the Roman proconsul would have his headquarters, was there in Ephesus. Uh, people called it the mother city of Asia. It was probably the most influential city in terms of politics and culture and religion and commerce, all these things. It was the place to be. Now, as far as religion in Ephesus, the dominant religion was the worship of the Ephesian Artemis. Okay? Uh, this is not the exact same as the Greek Artemis. They kind of used that term and kind of adopted it in some pieces of the Greek Artemis. And it was kind of a local, in a sense, uh, deity. Now, the temple of, the Ar of Artemis in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was an amazing building. You think of, everybody knows about the Parthenon in Athens, about this wonderful thing. This temple was four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. It was about the size of a, a, a football field and a half, somewhere about that. Uh, it had 127 columns that were 60 meters tall, no, 60 feet tall, excuse me. But still, that was impressive. Of course, it's not so impressive now, as you can see from the pictures. All, the ruins, all that is left standing is one column. So this Ephesian Artemis was considered a benevolent deity, a benevolent goddess. Um, 
but they thought of her as being extremely powerful. Almost the, they, they weren't just thinking of her as a local deity. They said that she w- had authority over heaven and earth and the underworld. They said that she could break the chains of fate. She sa- they said that he, she could protect against the hostile spirits of the underworld. Now, it's interesting, archaeologists, you can see there, have found a number of the statues or idols of this Ephesian Artemis. And just so you know, the, the bumps around the chest region are now generally thought to be representative of leather pouches called cursa. It was used in that culture. They, they would held magical items and totems, and they were thought to provide protection. Um, they were used for various m- magical incantations and, and rituals of various kinds. Of course, Artemis was not the only god worshipped in Ephesus. She was just the dominant religion. They also, there was also the worship of pretty much all the gods of, of Greece and Rome and Egypt. All had their, were represented there. Of course, there was also the worship of the Roman emperor, which was common throughout the Roman Empire. And then on top of this, Ephesus was known for its magical uh, practices. It was kind of the center of of, of magical learning, if you will. Archaeologists have found records of something called the Ephesian letters. That's what they call them now. They were six magical words that were used in charms and amulets and things like that. And uh, so this just kind of gives you a picture of the kind of religious influences that Paul would have been dealing with as he was coming and establishing the church in Ephesus. This is also the the sort of religious background that the people who became believers had come out of, the kind of baggage that they would have had that they were kind of carrying with them as they came into Christianity. Now, let me just give you some of the, the history of Paul's relationship with the church in Ephesus. Um, Paul first visited Ephesus briefly at the end of his second missionary journey. So this would have been about 52 AD, thereabouts. Uh, he left his friends Aquila and Priscilla there in Ephesus. He had met Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth um, during his ministry there. They were tent makers, the same as him, and so they kind of worked together, and then they supported him in his ministry. But then when he left Corinth, they came with him, and when he stopped off in Ephesus, they stayed there. So it may be Aquila and Priscilla who actually started the church in Ephesus. We're not entirely sure. Now, Acts chapter 19 records a lot of what we're going to be talking about, so you can start turning there. So um, what had happened was then Paul finished out his second missionary journey in Jerusalem. He wanted to go to one of the festivals there. At the end of that, uh, about a year later, he started out on his third missionary journey, as we call it. He traveled through the middle region of Asia and ended up in Ephesus. This probably is now probably 53 AD, roughly, thereabouts. So you can turn to Acts 19. We're going to be in Acts 19 just a little bit. So when he first got to Ephesus, he met some men there who had learned of the teaching of John the Baptist. They they knew about the the Messiah that was coming because of John the Baptist's teaching. So they were aware of the need for repentance, but they weren't aware of all the details about Christ's resurrection and his, his ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost and so on. So Paul completed their instruction, and when he did, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were, you know, spoken tongues and some other things. And then when Paul got to Ephesus proper, he started out his ministry in the synagogue, as he usually did, until they kicked him out, as they usually did. Um, And so here's the description, start in verse 8, Acts 19, verse 8, says, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them, taking the disciples, and conducted discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Pretty amazing. So besides preaching, it says that Paul taught classes every day in this lecture hall of Tyrannus. Some people have commented that this this must have been like the first Bible college or the first seminary. Um, And Paul's ministry, you see, was so fruitful over (coughs) over those next couple of years 
Look at the end of that. All the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. That's pretty extensive ministry. So what this probably means at the end of this is there's probably a network of churches in that area, uh, in Ephesus, in and around that province. I mean, actually, as an example of that, many think that the church in Colossae, we, we're pretty sure was started by a man named Epaphras. And uh, most likely, Epaphras was trained by Paul during this ministry time in Ephesus, and then he sent him as a church planter to go to Colossae, and he started the church there. So just as an example, the kind of ministry that was going on from, this, from Ephesus so then we also see that God was choosing to display amazing, miraculous power through Paul during his ministry there. We see this in verses 11 and 12. It says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands so that even face cloths or aprons that touched his skin were brought to the sick and diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. So why God chose to manifest his power in such a dramatic way in this time, we're not entirely certain, although maybe it was to show the, the true power as opposed to this, these other magical kind of things that were going on. But it's funny then, because then some Jewish exorcists try to, tried to copy Paul. Say, so, oh, they see all this power coming through him. This is, this is really cool. These were the seven sons of Siva, as it says. Try saying that five times fast. Um, but so these were guys that made a living going around and casting out evil spirits, or at least supposedly casting out evil spirits. And, and in, this is one of the most humorous stories in the Bible. This is actually really funny. Because um, they saw Paul's power. They, they thought, oh, it's that Jesus name that is using. That's what's going on here. So they thought of Jesus' name as just another magic word, that you just say it and you get what you want. It was kind of like an abracadabra to them. You just pronounce it over whatever, and, there, and, and things happen. But it didn't work out exactly that way. Let's look at verse 15. The evil spirit answered them after they tried to name his, the name of Jesus over them. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them. So they ran out of that house naked and wounded. They kind of, you don't use Jesus' name that way. It's not just a magic word. But this led the people of Ephesus to respect Christians. Even if they didn't become Christians themselves, they at least respected that something amazing was going on here. And, and the Christians, too, what we see in the, right after this, it seems like some of the Christians were trying to kind of bring some of their magical practices with them into, into the church. They hadn't really gotten rid of that. They thought they could kind of mix the two. I can still have my little amulet and, and keep off the evil spirits or whatever else. And this event with these uh, exorcists failing, you know, using it as a magic word, they, they were impressed by that, and so they repented, and it says they, they brought in all their magical books and their talismans and all these things and burned them, realizing that was not compatible with Christian faith. And it says that they were 50,000 pieces of silver worth of magical items. I don't know what that is in current dollars, but it has to be millions. I mean, so it was pretty amazing what God was doing through Paul in this place. So these events, though, should help you see why one of the key themes in the book of Ephesians is God's power. God's power over and above every other power. He's over all principalities and powers, and his power is, is at work in his followers. And we'll talk more about the themes here in a little bit. And then the last event in Ephesus that's recorded in Acts is, is a riot that we see described in verses 23 to 41. See, Paul's preaching had had such an effect in Ephesus and in that surrounding area that so many people had become Christians that people weren't worshiping Ephesian Artemis anymore. And these craftsmen who kind of made their living from making little trinkets and little little shrines and little souvenirs for those who came to the temple and all those kinds of things. They made their living from that. They weren't getting, people weren't buying them anymore. So they were actually losing money. And so they held this riot. And they filled the amphitheater Ephesus, it says. This went on for hours. I got a picture of the amphitheater in Ephesus as well. It's still there in the ruins. 
So they just filled this place and were just shouting for hours. Now, the, the point is, I mean, the, the, the riot was eventually dispersed and, and, and Paul got out of there and wasn't harmed. But the, the point is, this shows the huge effect that the gospel was having in Ephesus and in the surrounding area during this time. Paul was there for somewhere around three years and just the, the gospel made incredible inroads. Now, the last personal contact that Paul had directly with the church at Ephesus was he now left Ephesus, continued on his third missionary journey, and on his way back to Jerusalem, he stopped by um, Miletus. You could actually, sh- I don't think it shows Miletus on the map that I have on there, but it's just not far from Ephesus on the coast. And he, he called for the elders of the church in Ephesus to come meet him there in Miletus. And, and this is what he says this is in Acts chapter 20. Verse 21, verse 20 and 21, I want to read. He says to them, You know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable, or from teaching you publicly and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And I just bring that up just to show you how personal, how thorough was Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Then he later in that same talk with the elders, he warned them that false teachers are going to come. You need to be careful. You need to be vigilant because false teachers are going to come into this church. And in fact, some of you, even among you elders, will arise false teachers who will try to lead away the church after them. Now, when we come to the letter to Ephesus, it seems like that hadn't happened yet. Because what we'll see in there, that was probably about six or seven years later after this that he wrote the letter to, to the Ephesian church. And we don't see him, like, going after false teachers. He's not directly opposing any sort of false teachers. So it seems like those false teachers had not arisen yet. However, when in, the, in 2 Timothy, Paul wrote a letter to Timothy. In that letter, he's sending Timothy to Ephesus to go deal with false teachers who had risen up. This is probably two to three years after he wrote the letter to the Ephesian church. So they did, what he had predicted, what he had warned those elders about had happened at that, at that point, and he was sending Timothy as his kind of special delegate to go deal with these false teachers that had risen up. So now, that's, that's kind of Paul's history with the Ephesian church. Now some, with all this extensive history that Paul had with the church in Ephesus, some people have asked, why is there a lack of kind of personal information and kind of relational warmth in this letter? I mean, like you see in Philippians, for example, really personal. With this three years with this church and all this time, why isn't it not more personal? And why does Paul say things like in Ephesians 1.15, where he says, Sin- Since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. That makes it sound like he didn't really know them, right? Well, I think the easy explanation is that it had been six or seven years since Paul had been there. There had been a lot of new converts, a lot of more people becoming believers and being added to the church at that time, and they they didn't know Paul, and he didn't know them. So he may have known some of the key figures, the core people, but not the majority. And probably also this letter was intended as a circular letter. In other words, it was intended to be read at numerous congregations around the city of Ephesus and around that province, which would lead it to be a little less personal. So that kind of covers the historical cultural context behind uh, the book of Ephesians. Now I want to look, go back to the, the letter itself. I want to talk about why did Paul write this letter? What's his point? What's he trying to get across? <clears throat> well, first of all, we see in verse 2, just to kind of complete this, we see that Paul gives his standard greeting. This is pretty much the same one that he he gives, and actually it's almost the exact same wording as seven others of his letters. Now when he says this, grace, and pe- grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not, it's not exactly a prayer, it's kind of like invoking God's blessings of grace and peace upon the church. It's interesting here that Paul does a little wordplay with this greeting. The typical word you would use for greetings in in that day when you would write a letter that you would put at the beginning of a letter, it was the Greek word karain, which literally just means greetings. That's how it was used. It was just like saying hello 
And so that was the typical word, but Paul here uses the word charis, the Greek word charis, which is off the same root, but doesn't just mean greetings, it means grace, unmerited favor. And not only that, that same word is the one that's used to translate the Hebrew word chesed all throughout the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So it borrows that meaning of that word, which means steadfast love. We saw it in Psalm 103 several times when it said loving kindness, steadfast covenant love. That's that word. And the word grace, charis, drew, drew some of that, that meaning because it was so often translated, uh, used to translate the, the Hebrew word chesed. So this word is the center of the gospel message. This word is the centerpiece of Paul's theology. And we'll hear about grace a lot as we go through the book of Ephesians. The word occurs 12 times. Even though the word is only used 12 times, that concept it just saturates this book. It's just full of the concept of grace. You know, grace is God's undeserved favor, providing salvation for sinners. Not only is it that, it's also his ongoing provision as he enables his people to live in line with his expectations and to accomplish the ministry which he has entrusted to us. So he calls for grace on his readers. Paul also calls for peace. Now, peace is another one of the main blessings of the new covenant in Christ. Romans 5.1 says that since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. See, before we were enemies, we were rebels, but now in Christ we have peace. Also in Philippians 4.7, it says that when you put your full trust in God, when you pour out your prayers to him in thanksgiving and, and requests, then it says the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So these are the things that Paul wanted the believers in Ephesus to experience in their own lives. These are the things that he wants us to experience as we go through this book. But that's something that he wanted for all the churches that he wrote to. What's something more specific for this letter? What's behind this letter? Now, as far as a specific situation, it's hard to tell because this, as they say, is the least situational of all of Paul's letters. It's hardest to identify a specific situation that brought about the writing. Because like Galatians, you can tell there was Judaizers coming into the church and he's writing to, to combat those Judaizers and say that they're, they're, they're corrupting the gospel. Or 1 Corinthians, he wrote because the Corinthians wrote to him and he's responding to their letter and because there were specific sin situations that he had to address. But Ephesians doesn't arise from any compelling circumstances like that. So I think the best explanation for why did he write this book is that it's just kind of out of his affection and concern for this church where he had spent so much time, or really you could say this network of churches that was established around Ephesus. And it, he, he was given a, an opportunity to do this because there was this crisis situation in Colossae that he had to write to, and he had a man named Tychicus who was going to carry that letter to Colossae. And Ephesus is right on the way from Rome to Colossae, so he could just, hey, Tychicus, take this letter too to Ephesus. Give me a chance to, to kind of share my heart with this church. I mean, he'd invested heavily in blood, sweat, and tears in Ephesus. So now he wanted to solidify the foundation of these believers. He wanted to strengthen them against the cultural pressures that they felt. So that's the same thing he wants to do with us through this letter. So here's how one, one commentary author describes the purpose of the letter. I think this, was, this one's pretty good. He says, with this letter, Paul sought to affirm the believers in Ephesus in their new identity in Christ as a means of strengthening them in their ongoing struggle with the powers of darkness to promote a greater unity between Jews and Gentiles within and among the churches in the area and to stimulate an ever-increasing transformation of their lifestyles into greater conformity to the purity and holiness that God called them to display. So may God do exactly that in this church through this letter, just as the purpose was to do that in Ephesus so many years ago. Amen. Amen. Yes. Now, let me just kind of introduce us to some of the themes that we'll see running through the book of Ephesus. This is kind of like the teaser trailer uh, 
This is kind of the preview of coming attractions uh, that I hope gets you excited about this book. So broadly speaking, Ephesus is divided into two halves. Um, the first three chapters are primarily doctrinal. Uh, in them, Paul tells us of the truths about Christ and about our salvation in Christ. Uh, we can tell this, that most of the verbs in the first three chapters of Ephesians are what we call indicatives. In other words, they tell us something that is true. They don't tell us to do something. But then in the second half, verses, chapters 4 through 6, they're primarily exhortation. They tell us how now we should live now that we are in Christ. And most of the verbs, as we'll find in, in that time, in that, those last three chapters, are imperatives. In other words, they give us a command. They tell us what we should do. So chapters 1 through 3 tells us who we are in Christ. Chapters 4 through 6 tells us how we should behave now that we are in Christ. Now, so that what we'll see is that the dominant overarching theme in the book is our union with Christ. When we are joined with Christ by faith. One of the things we did in that high school Bible study I was telling you about where I first studied Ephesians was the, Tom had us go through the book, and it, particularly in the first three chapters, but you can check in the other ones. It's not as much in the last three chapters, but particularly the first, first three chapters, go through and circle everywhere it says in Christ or with Christ, or in him when the him is referring to Christ, or anything like that. Circle all of those, and you'll find a lot of them. I still have those, those circles here in, in my old Bible. That might be a ex good exercise for you to do when you go home. And then list all the blessings that you have in Christ. All the things that you receive because you are in Christ. All the things you now are because you are in Christ. Our union with Christ. See, it's by the grace of God, we are joined with Christ by faith. And so now we are seen by God as having paid the penalty for our sins because Christ died. And now we are seen by God as righteous because Jesus Christ was righteous. That is what our union does. Because of this union with Christ, it says we have now a new identity as children of God. We see this in Ephesians 1.5. Adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. So because of this, we now have an inheritance. We are co-heirs with Christ. And it says we are given the Holy Spirit as a seal of our family ties now in Christ, which is a guarantee of our inheritance. It says then later in, in chapter 2, verse 1, it says that we were dead... But now by our union with Christ, we are made alive in Christ. Verse 5. It says we are saved from the wrath of God by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It says that we are changed from being before we were objects of wrath. Now it says we are workmanship. We are Christ's, or we're God's workmanship in Christ. What's that saying is, just think about an artist. You know, an artist has a portfolio of all their work, right? They have all the, all the different, ob, you know, sculptures or paintings or whatever it is that they've done. But they have one piece that is their pride and joy. This is the one, if anyone wants to see what is the greatest example of your work, this is the piece they show them. That is what that word means, workmanship. We're the show-off piece. The one God says, look at my work. That's what it's talking about. We were objects of wrath. Now we are his workmanship. That is what we have become by virtue of our union with Christ. And then in the second half of the book, Paul exhorts us now to behave like Christ. Since we are united with Christ in who we are, now we need to be like Christ also in how we conduct ourselves. Like he says in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, No longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their thoughts. So he's saying you need to get rid of all those behaviors that characterized who you were before. You need to take them off, he says, like they were an old filthy set of clothes. And he said you need to put on the new self, he says in verse 24. The new self that is created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. 
Then again, in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul exhorts us to be imitators of God as dearly loved children. So our identity in Christ is now that we are, now we are beloved children of God, and so our response should be to look at our Father and say, oh, that's how He is. I want to be like that. Imitate Him. It also says we should follow the example of Jesus Christ in verse 2. Then in chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says, You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. That's You have a new identity. You are now light. And then he says, Because you are light, live like light. Because this is what you are, be this way. Live as children of light, he says. And then everything that Paul says in those passages about husbands and wives, about parents and children, slaves and masters, that is just going into more detail, describing what it looks like to live out this new identity that we now have in Christ. So it has been well said that Ephesians is all about identity formation. You know, in in the Marine Corps, we have boot camp. That's all about identity formation. The drill instructors are beating it into the recruits' heads. This is what it looks like to be a Marine. You are now marine. It's forming that identity in them. Well, Ephesians is not boot camp exactly, but it's identity formation in that same way. This is what it looks like to be a Christ follower. You are a Christ follower. You are in Christ. This is what it looks like now to live that way. Another theme in Ephesians, like I mentioned before, is the power of God. We see this flow through in several places. This was to remind the Ephesians that the God that they serve is more powerful than any of those gods that they used to serve. And more powerful than any of those spirits they used to try to conjure up with their magical arts. They were, he was more powerful than the Roman emperor. More powerful than anything else. It's interesting, Paul prays in Ephesians 1.19, he prays that the Ephesians would come to know this power. He says in Ephesians 1.19, I pray that you might know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. Just notice all the terms piled up in that prayer for the Ephesians. Immeasurable, greatness, power, mighty, strength. And then Paul goes on to describe how this power worked. In verses 20 to 23, he said it worked by raising Christ from the dead. That's the kind of power he's talking about. By exalting Christ, verse 21, far above every ruler and authority and power and dominion and every title given, not only in this age, but in the one to come. That's the power we're talking about. And then this theme of power pops up again in in chapter 3. This is Paul's second prayer for for the Ephesians. He says this in chapter 3, verse 16. He says, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. And then he praises God this way, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. So the incredible magnitude of God's power that we've just talked about, and that is the power that works in us. And so talking about that power, that's, yes, that puts us where we don't have to fear those little G gods or those spirits that they used to be worried about for us, maybe political powers, any of those other things. But it is also that power that works in us to enable us to live the life that he calls us to, chapters 4 through 6. He's not saying just do that in your own strength. He's saying this power works in you to do these things that I'm calling you to do. And then at the end of chapter 6 comes the well-known passage about the armor of God, which continues that theme of power. Starts out this way, verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10. Finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. And And it describes the armor through which we stand against the hostile powers of darkness. And it ends this way in verse 18. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request. Stay alert with all all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. 
And in verse 19, pray. And in verse 20, pray. Why? Because prayer is how you connect to the power of God. Because the power isn't yours, the power is God's. And by praying, you ask him to, in, to demonstrate his power through you in your life and those kinds of things. He, it is his power. But he exercises his power on our behalf when we ask him in accordance with his will. Now the third theme that I will mention is unity in the church. Paul's point here is that because you are united with Christ, all those who are united with Christ are also united with each other. In this letter, Paul repeatedly refers to the church as the body, with Christ as the head. And then in the second half of chapter 2, this is where Paul really hits on unity hard. He says in verse 3 of chapter 2, But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So this has now brought the Jews and the Gentiles together into one. Jews and Gentiles are more opposed and more different than any of the racial animosity we see in our country. And if they could be brought together into one by Christ, then how much more that we should be brought together as one in Christ. And this is all through the blood of Christ, it says. In verse 16, it says this, He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. So his point is, we're all saved the same way. We all come in destitute, dead, unable to save ourselves. We all depend on the grace of Christ. We all have access the same way through one spirit to the Father. Since we're all saved by grace through faith, then we are all one with each other. With the result then, verse 19, he says... So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. And then he goes on, just as with our identity, so also with our unity, Paul moves from saying, this is what you are, therefore act like it. He does the same thing about unity. He says, you are united into one body, now act united. That comes up in chapter 4. I'm going to verse, read a couple of verses here, or actually a few. Chapter 4, starting in verse 1, he says, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling that you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity in the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. One. Over and over again. And notice this, those of you in the theology class, you might be interested to note that what unites the church here is common belief. A common body of belief. In verses 4 through 6, Paul mentions seven of the 13 major topic areas of systematic theology. That's not his main point, I get that, but it's there. He says one body, that's ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. One spirit, that's pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. One hope, that's eschatology, the doctrine of last things. One Lord, that's Christology, one faith. And he's talking about the content of faith, not the act of faith. So that's the things that we believe are common convictions. That comes from scripture, so that's bibliology, the doctrine of the Bible. One baptism, that's relating to sal salvation, how we are saved, so it's soteriology. And one God, theology proper. It is those common beliefs, common convictions that unite us. Now he's not talking about every det nitinoid detail of every little theological point you could possibly make. He's talking about the core convictions that we hold are what unite us. We are united around our theology. That's why it's so important that we know what it is we believe. 
And then through the latter part of chapter 4 and into chapter 5 and 6, Paul describes the kinds of behaviors that promote unity. He, he talks about not lying, not stealing, speaking words that build people up. He talks about kindness and compassion and forgiveness and mutual submission to one another within the church, properly ordered family relationships, all the rest. In, he says, if you act in all these ways, that will promote unity in the church. So in this book, I hope you are seeing that Paul will teach us what it means to be a Christian. He'll teach us what it means to be part of a church. And I hope in just this little bit that this has whetted your appetite for what is going to come in this series. We're going to see that we are united with Christ by faith in his atoning death on the cross. We have an entirely new identity now. We are children of God and we share that identity with all others who are united with Christ by faith. So we are joined with Christ. We are joined with each other. And since we have this new identity, we've been called now into the family of God. Therefore, we must live worthy, as he said, of the calling which we have received. And all the while, depending on the power of God that is at work in us. And why do we do this? So that God might receive all the glory. In Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. All these amazing blessings that you've given to us. Your word says that you've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly, heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. We who were once enemies and strangers have now been blessed as children of God. We can do nothing but thank you and worship you and offer our lives to you. Lord, we pray that you would give us soft hearts to receive the truth of your word, that you would help us to depend on your power to live out the truths that you show us in this, past, in this word, in this book. Lord, build us up as individual believers and as a church so that you might receive honor and glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen.